So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us at this call webinar, uh, Indigenous Data Management, uh, with our uh, speaker today, Stacey Allison uh, Casson. And uh, we, I've already mentioned, but for those of you who weren't here when I um, when I mentioned it, if you could please mute, make sure you mute yourself, and if you could please turn off your video uh, during this uh, during Stacy's uh, presentation, just uh, to improve the uh, the experience for everybody, especially those with low bandwidth, that would be great. Um, we will be saving questions to the end, um, but I, at first off, I am, and we are recordings, just so everybody is aware of that. Uh, and the recording will be posted to the call website and YouTube channel shortly after the end of the meeting. Um, so uh, I, first I'd like to acknowledge that call CBPA represents member libraries from across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. Uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit, of Nunatsiavut and Nunatukavut, uh, the Inu of Natasinan, uh, the Beothic, and the Mi'kmaq peoples. Um, in Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. And in New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Wulastuiq, uh, the Mi'kmaq, and the Passamaquoddy peoples. Uh, we at Call CBPA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the first peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. Uh, at this point in the session, I would like to turn it over to Samantha Adima, who is moderating the session for Stacy. Samantha. Thank you, Cynthia. So good afternoon. My name is Samantha Adima, and I'm the Indigenous Services Librarian at Dalhousie University. On behalf of Call CVPA, the Digital Preservation Stewardship Committee, and the Indigenous Knowledge Committee, I would like to welcome you to Indigenous Data Management with Stacy Allison Casson. Uh, the session is being recorded and will be available after the presentation on the call CBPA website. And again, we ask that all attendees please mute their microphones and turn off their webcams during the presentation. If you have technical problems, you can put them in the chat box. And if you have any questions for Stacy during the presentation, put them in the chat as well, and there will be a Q&A uh, period at the end. I'd now like to introduce Stacy Allison Casson, who will be speaking on the Indigenous Data Management. Stacey Allison Casson is an assistant professor with the School of Information Management at Dalhousie University. She's a citizen of the Métis Nation of Ontario, chair of the Indigenous Matters Standing Committee, Committee of IFWA, a community lead in the National Knowledge and Language Alliance, and a member of many other advisory bodies. Stacey believes strongly in finding ways to make access to information more equitable and has been involved in open access initiatives in North America for many years. Stacey? Thank you, uh, Samantha, for that introduction, and I'm really happy to be here, and I'm sorry about my technical challenges um, off the top of this uh, meeting, right when I'm about to go on. So I'm going to uh, hopefully share my screen. Can everybody see my slides? I hope. <laughs> Oh, good. Now I'm also, I moved room, so my screen is actually backwards. So uh, just forgive me if I have any challenges moving my slides forward. So I also want to just say um, welcome and um, uh, to everybody here. As I said, I'm really um, pleased to see so many people, or at least see the little circles for so many people today. And I also want to um, likewise acknowledge uh, that I am on um, Indigenous territories. I'm on um, the, the lands of the Mi'kmaq in Mi'kma'ki. And also um, just mentioned that although we're meeting virtually, of course, the technologies that allow us to meet are traveling through um, many different Indigenous territories. Um, and that uh, the also the technologies that allow us to meet uh, our computers, all of the resources, um, including the uh, metals that are involved in the construction of our computers, all also come from uh, territories which um, may be um, subject to um, inequitable conditions. So something to consider um, where you are. And a little bit more about me. So I'm originally from Thunder Bay, Ontario. 
uh, up in Northern Ontario. I grew up in Winnipeg, Manitoba, recently living in the Toronto area and now in, um, in Halifax. And so uh, I've lived in many different uh, territories um, and I'm uh, really, really delighted to be here, um, as I said, in Mi'kmaq. So I was thinking about uh, what to talk about uh, today, and I want to just say that I'm thinking this should be a relatively, um, I hope, informal conversation, and so I'm hoping to leave some time um, at the end for us to also uh, chat and um, if you have questions. And I also am aware that a number of you may be on different places uh, on this journey. Um, in your organizations or individually, and I want to acknowledge that there are many uh, people here with all different kinds of expertise. So uh, part of the intention today, too, is to just have some space for us to talk about um, research data management, about Indigenous data, and to think about this idea that metadata is a love note to the future, and thinking about those future contexts of data as well. And I think fundamentally um, something I want to connect to this idea of Love Data Week is to think about this, this um, importance of Indigenous peoples need to be able to derive benefit from the data. And I think that is um, one of those fundamental concepts, uh, of course, mentioned in the um, CARE uh, principles that we can uh, consider when thinking about research data management plans or research data management uh, more generally. Because when we want to think about the future, so there's managing data in the present and uh, thinking about how data needs to be managed in the context of an existing research project or for an existing collection. But really, one of the important parts of thinking about uh, research data management is also the future use. And again, looking at the care principles, um, making sure to consider also future harm. So again, something that might be in the present or even in the recent past as um, something that was considered uh, an appropriate practice might not be in the future. So thinking about uh, the, the idea of the metadata as a love note to the future, how can we be looking forward to the future um, I guess, life of that uh, research data. And certainly, I think in the context of research data management for a long time, there has been this um, referring to research data as being part of a life cycle. So we talk a lot about these use of different metaphors and things when we talk about data. So the data ecosystem, the data landscape, and then we also have the research data life cycle. And the life cycle does imply this kind of you know, born, living, dead, reborn. I, you know, that it has that kind of implication. So, how can we think, maybe uh, consider again what this means for the for the future? And in this talk, I wanted to frame part of this conversation about some work happening through the National Indigenous Knowledge and Language Alliance. I know um, some of you. Ha, are familiar with uh, Nicola already. If you're not, I, I really actually, you know what I'm going to do before I, oh, I'll put it in later. I have a list of um, resources that I, I created a page in a Google Doc that has all these links. So don't worry too much right now about um, trying to sort or track down all the links. I'll put that in the end. If I forget, somebody please remind me to, to drop that link into the, uh, into the chat. So uh, Nicola, is a relatively, yeah, yes, <laughs> I agree, <laughs> Mackenzie. Um, so Nicola is a fairly new association that is Indigenous focused and Indigenous led and um, is um, really also something that is moving across sort of our, um, I want to say our, our silos or our boundaries that often we have in a professional association work and um, really also focused on, on Indigenous uh, matters or issues uh, specifically. 
And uh, in the charter document of NICLA, there, these are these five identified activities. So building a community practice, public advocacy for indigenous cultural transmission, professional development for members, unsettling and disrupting existing frameworks and pedagogy and scholarship and grants. And this, uh, while this um, association is indigenous um, led and focused, it is of course very um, open to uh, indigenous allies as well. And so uh, again, I invite you to, um, if you have not, to uh, look at NICLA and consider joining. Um, and uh, as well, so I'm not going to read this particular slide, but again, I encourage you to, to look at this after uh, this presentation as well. So I wanted to frame some of this conversation around the National Indigenous Terminology Platform Project, which is a project coming out of um, out of NICLA, co-led by myself and Camille um, Collison, and um, uh, really has been in development for a number of years. Again, I know that some of you have been part of this work for uh, for a long time as well. Um, and uh, again, you can go to the NICLA website to um, see some of the presentation materials and to get a, a better sense of the project because I'm going to be fairly brief with some of this um, overview. But this project is focused on uh, vocabulary, terminology, um, subject headings, which we know um, have been problematic in the context of library descriptive practices. We know that many of the subject headings um, coming out of the Library of Congress are problematic, are racist, are inappropriate for use um, within the country now known as Canada. And so this uh, project is really focused on uh, how can we re, not even rebuild, create a platform that is right from the beginning Indigenous uh, indigenous led and for use across our different uh, kinds of organizations. So not just focused on libraries, but also thinking about archives, um, other kinds of um, repositories or needs as well. So when we think about research data management, we know that many uh, universities uh, don't just have a library catalog where we're um, organizing uh, indigenous data, but there might be other kinds of repositories or databases or systems that are also um, managing uh, research data. So what would it look like to think about that from that sort of cross domain uh, perspective? And particularly important in this project is thinking about creating a platform where the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is really foundational to the platform itself. So. Um, Many projects and repositories and systems, we think about there's an existing repository or an existing system and we sort of build Indigenous um, frameworks out from those existing projects. So instead, this project is really focused on if we start from the beginning and we're thinking or building intentionally with UNDRIP as the framework, what could that look like? And then appropriate to this conversation around uh, Indigenous research data management, um, of course, is the entirety of UNDRIP. So if you have not uh, reviewed UNDRIP, I, I encourage you to do so. But I've just pulled out um, Article 31 here as a particularly um, relevant article when we talk about, uh, about Indigenous data or Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous cultural materials, because it, it states quite clearly that Indigenous people have the right to maintain, control, protect, and develop cultural heritage, traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expressions, as well as science, technologies, and cultures. And, it, and it, the list goes on. And it, it's not, um, it's very clear that it isn't um, bounded by uh, something that's potentially in the past or excluding sciences or excluding technologies. And so if we take UNDRIP as being foundational to the way that we should work or consider working with um, research, research data, then um, it does mean that Indigenous people need to have that uh, control and have the right to control. And of course, this 
um, is potentially very challenging in institutional contexts where there has not uh, necessarily been that um, history of of um, ensuring that the peoples who are connected with research projects or research materials have the ability to um, state what happens or how that research material should be uh, controlled. And again, this this is not, uh, I'm just thinking of examples for not just Indigenous peoples, so there isn't necessarily those frameworks set up, but UNDRIP is very, very clear about that need for, for control. And so this um, concept, or not even concept, but the, the need for um, Indigenous peoples to have control over their data is very, very um, important. And uh, when we talk about uh, decolonization or indigitization or other um, terms for ensuring Indigenous people are involved in research, it does mean again, that Indigenous people have the right to make decisions uh, and be in control of that, uh, of that data. So in the context of the uh, NICLA terminologies project, um, these are sort of three uh, important um, issues, but I'm going to draw your attention to the last box, which talks about Indigenous knowledge and data sovereignty as recognized as a human right. So what does it mean in the context of research data management, of knowledge organization, of our, our entire, we're going to use ecosystem again, of um, the ways that we consider and approach uh, Indigenous knowledge uh, and Indigenous research if we, uh, again, really strongly consider the ways that uh, data sovereignty must be respected and is a human right. And uh, it's not optional. I know that sometimes um, this work is extremely challenging, figuring out how to bring together um, colonial organizations and, um, and Indigenous practices or recognizing Indigenous sovereignty. And I think um, sometimes the word that comes to mind when, when uh, I'm thinking about this topic, or certainly um, just thinking about a talk I heard from Dr. Alan Corbier from York University, who's talking about the sort of incommensurability of, of Indigenous knowledge systems and colonial knowledge systems. And so it is extremely challenging when we try to bring two things together or multiple things together when we talk about Indigenous knowledge systems and a, and a university, for example, that there are uh, things that don't just um, come together easily because there is sort of an incommensurability in those underlying structures. So it is absolutely, um, absolutely a challenge. Um, and I uh, want to acknowledge <laughs> my uh, slide here. I want to acknowledge my my research partner, um, Camille uh, Callison, for this particular slide focusing on the four R's, uh, but also adding the fifth R in here for Indigenous knowledge or relationships. So reverence, reciprocity, respect, and responsibility. And these four R's uh, originally developed um, for education, particularly uh, um, helpful in thinking about guiding the development of things like research data management uh, um, plans or practices, because if these uh, four or five, and actually I'm going to flip the next slide also with thanks to uh, Camille, because this is the six R's of STEM. And so if we take these um, these as, as guiding uh, principles, and I'm going to keep coming back to this, I think this idea of guiding principles, I'm just realizing we have, we have UNDRIP, we have the four slash five slash six R's, and then I'll talk about um, care and OCAP as well. And so we have, we do have sets of frameworks or principles that are helpful in um, giving guidance or providing frameworks or being uh, ways that we can approach this work uh, to be able to um, attempt 
to do this work in a good way. And I think that that although there are these principles and um, practices and things, it doesn't necessarily mean there's an easy set of answers or that there's a checkbox you can necessarily um, fill out. I don't think that that is um, the way uh, that this kind of work um, happens. So just to go back to the terminology project, and I'm interweaving some of this content about the terminology project in this particular talk, because like research data management, we know that this area of terminology has also been a sort of long-standing um, challenge area for libraries. And this particular project is, is instead of um, potentially modifying a colonial system, it's like, what if we started from the very beginning with trying to um, create something that brings these principles and practices and understandings in from the beginning. So this particular project has this uh, initial seed funding phase, an implementation phase, and then moving to membership. And again, I don't want to spend too long on here because I want to leave time for us to have some discussion. But again, uh, it's Indigenous led, it's sustainable and stable. Um, community contributions and collaborative platform for vocabulary sets. So you can see that there is some alignment with the ways that we also consider research data management in thinking about what does it mean for something to be Indigenous led, but also focusing on sustainability um, as another piece that's really important. And if we talk about Love Data Week and we talk about metadata or data as being a love note to the future, um, and we look at that future uh, the importance of thinking about the future, really focusing on um, that sustainability is um, also really important. So again, I won't read this whole slide, but you can see some of the key project elements and in particular the way that the project is intended to um, align with the fair and care principles. Um, as a, uh, again, way that we want this work to happen and is really best for this work to happen. And as I was mentioning, sustainability is really important, as is so solidarity, uh, reciprocity, and responsibility. And so uh, when we talk about research data management or sort of the data ecosystem writ large, in our institutions, focusing in particular on, um, on ways of working that recognize these importance of solidarity, reciprocity, um, and responsibility will help ensure that we're doing um, the work in a, a way that is um, appropriate. Um, and in consideration of the fact that, again, although this work is not easy, it is extremely important and I want to stress as well. I know that probably all of you are, are or if you're involved in research data management, you have a pressing need to figure some of these things out because of the requirements of the federal government. But um, I want to also mention that I think it's important that this become part of our regular work um, in libraries and that uh, sometimes I know it can be considered something that is done uh, when the other work is, is completed. Um, so other uh, work around research data, or research data management, or looking at scholarly communication kinds of issues, that this is sometimes an add-on. And I hope that, um, that we see this work related to um, Indigenous data or Indigenous knowledges as something that is uh, part of regular practice, rather than something that sort of sits as an extra that um, if there's someone around who can do it or has an interest, rather than part of our regular way of working. Um, exciting news from a couple of weeks ago, I'll mention quickly that we do have a seed funding for the NICLA project. Um, and I want to give a, a, a huge thank you to uh, all of our associations that are members of CARL or of CULC as well as CRKN. Um, and our federal government partners um, for this. So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, research data 
and something I think is important to recognize. So if some of you may be familiar with this um, article, information has value, uh, it was in um, the journal library uh, with a lead pipe, and it talks about the ways that um, information and data is, is a commodity. And we know that our institutions are very interested in research data, but also in statistics about who is researching and recognizing that that data as a commodity um, and considering that sort of political economy or the way that capitalism is part of the functioning of a university is is important when we talk about uh, when we talk about indigenous data. Um, because uh, again of its connection to capitalism and how we, we're going to go back to that incommensurate uh, word when we talk about indigenous systems of knowledge or indigenous ways of working and the collective as a problematic um, way of being in the context of research because research as is envisioned or practiced at most universities is so focused on the individual. And so when we talk about collective rights, there is a particular problem in, in research. So considering um, what that means in the concept, and I don't, I don't have a solution <laughs> offered necessarily, as I said, it's not necessarily a checkbox, but to recognize um, that as important. And I, I like this particular um, way that Maui Hudson has talked about um, open data as a particular problem because of its connection to extraction. And so when we consider the connections between research data, research itself as a commodity and its connection to extraction, it really, I think, helps us consider what do we need to do when we want to appropriately um, put in place policies and ways of working that are going to ensure that that uh, whatever is there is not extractive and remember that it has to benefit Indigenous people. Um, I won't spend time defining all of these things because I know we're, um, as I said, I want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, this is the tri-agency definition of what is research data. Uh, and it is in my list of resources. And then um, research data management. So I was mentioning before that um, research data lifecycle. When we think about, again, we don't just have storage and access, but we also have the preservation aspect of it. And also that focus on reuse. And uh, again, when we talk about Indigenous data and we talk about the future and we talk about extraction, we have to think about what, what happens to that data after a research project. So what happens before our protocols in place that make sure that that data is collected in an appropriate way, what happens during the research project, but then also what happens um, afterward. And so in the tri-agency data management policy in section 3.1, it does say recognize that a distinctions based approach is needed to ensure that the unique rights and interests of circumstances of the First Nations, Métis and Inuit are acknowledged, affirmed and implemented. And what I thought I would stress uh, today in this is that it's that means that it's not a not a one size fits all in the case of research data management. So we need to make sure that we're recognizing the distinctiveness of individual indigenous nations. So it's not that you can um, implement a policy or to be careful when implementing or developing a policy that it is going to um, make sure to recognize that distinctiveness. And we can see back, if I go back here, that the tri-agency has that as part of their um, data management policy to say there is a distinctions-based approach. So that means what works for the Métis Nation, and I won't even get into the politics of the Métis Nation, is not necessarily going to work um, for the Mi'kmaq. Right? There is like variation and even variation down to which community you're talking to. 
So that absolutely needs to be recognized because in a lot of our colonial systems that we have in place in libraries, there is a sort of universalizing force or we, we tend to develop standards and systems that are meant to work across and be uh, the same for all. And that really can't um, happen in this kind of context because it's not necessarily appropriate. I won't read this whole thing, um, but I did want to flag that I think um, very soon um, this particular standard will come out. So the IEEE SAP 2890, which is the recommended practice for the provenance of Indigenous peoples data. And so I think at this moment, what we're seeing also is the emergence of standards and protocols and um, principles and practices that are going to be helpful in um, in developing and uh, maintaining policy and practices in relation to Indigenous knowledges, Indigenous data um, from all different kinds of perspectives. And I think at this moment, we're, we're seeing these being developed, but we're kind of still at that um, sort of emerging um, stage. And so when we talk about Indigenous data sovereignty, again, it is about the appropriate authority or locus of control for Indigenous peoples um, on their territories, in their ways of in the ways of life. And so, again, I'm speaking from from my perspective um, as a citizen of the Métis Nation that the Métis Nation of Ontario has a particular um, area and um, and peoples over whom that is sort of appropriate for um us to consider other territories totally not not appropriate right that's not wouldn't necessarily be um in our purview and also to mention something that kind of complicates um factors but should be should be recognized as well is oftentimes we have um overlapping territories overlapping histories and so how to recognize that as well. And so going back to this um, provenance of Indigenous people's data, this is not yet released, so I, I can't um, talk too much about it, except to say that there is um, considerations for how we understand, again, where data comes from um, and being able to attach information so that data can potentially travel through its life cycle, going to that research data life cycle and have that provenance information um, intact. I've been mentioning all along or right at the early part of this talk, looking at my time here, uh, of the care principles. So these come from the Global Indigenous Data Alliance. And again, I do have that list of resources. So don't get too worried if you don't have this resource already. And so this is the care principles uh, for Indigenous data governance, collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility and ethics. And some of you may be familiar with the care principles um, already and may be considering um, the care principles in relation to research data management. Um, or maybe, uh, maybe not. Um, there is also OCAP, um, which if we had more time, I would play this video, but we don't, so <laughs> have it in your list of resources, um, which is ownership control and acquisition possession. And so I also want to mention while OCAP is, is very helpful, it is for First Nations data. And so again, going back to that recognition that there are, um, many uh, different Indigenous nations within the country now known as Canada and to understand that what is appropriate and um, sort of falls under um, something that that fits well with OCAP doesn't necessarily work for all uh, all nations. So just to be aware that when we talk about OCAP, it's in a very specific um, context as well uh, and to um, not consider that as something that's going to work for, for everybody. Um, and I mentioned in my bio, or you heard in my bio, that I've been involved in the open access movement um, for quite a long time. And it's been interesting to trace 
a realization in the open um, movement from a global context that um, there needed to be some interventions or rethinking of a of a way of of talking about openness as if it means um, equity. And so we again are seeing this uh, a greater awareness around the need to ensure that Indigenous people have control of their own materials or of our own materials. And that means tempering um, some of that drive for making everything open. And so finally, I want to end with this particular quote because it's not just about um, institutions or organizations making decisions for uh, Indigenous peoples, but that we need to also have um, meaningful participation. And um, I like, uh, you've, you maybe I've heard about capacity sharing, but I like uh, Kara Kim Kimpertich at um, University of Toronto, who talks about it as, um, or capacity building, so she's talked about it as capacity sharing. So rather than think about organizations as building up some missing capacity uh, in Indigenous people, to think about it rather as as sharing capacity and thinking about um, how do you meaningfully involve Indigenous people, not just as a checkbox or to say we finished something, now we're coming to see if it's okay, but to ensure that uh, Indigenous people are involved from the beginning and also have ongoing and meaningful participation so that uh, Indigenous people actually have that um, data themselves or ourselves and are able to um, uh, do the work ourselves rather than, than having that uh, be for, for uh, other institutions to do. So I think that sometimes I end with a, with a quote that talks about whether something should be in universities to begin with. And I think that that's another um, point that's important to consider that given the sort of colonial nature of many institutions to, to consider whether um, that data should be in an institutional repository at a university at all. I think that is an extremely valid um, question to ask. OK, so I think we still have time uh, to to talk, and so I'm going to. Oh, OK, you're still here. I thought I'd lost. Oh, OK, sorry, everybody. This is my backwards. OK, there's my cursor. So my my screen, my other screen is backwards from from here. So I'm going to stop sharing. Great, OK. Thank you for your presentation. That was amazing. And if anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat or raise your hand. Can you see the chat, Stacey? I can, yeah. OK. I'm just putting the my list of resources in the chat there. So if you um, want to check them out or you don't know uh, some of these resources, you should be able to, to see them there. Uh, okay, I see a question from Alexandra. Hi, thank you for um, a very interesting presentation. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to the, sorry, no, I'm looking at the wrong screen. I'm looking at you, but <laughs> not at the camera. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to the line in the IEE provenance uh, document that I think said uh, something that, um, encouraged developing common descriptors and controlled vocabulary. And I'm thinking that maybe that's a bit in tension with the, the need to acknowledge and embrace and embody the uniqueness. Um, and I, and on, a, on a practical implementation across library systems and across RDM systems, um, how are we going to do that? Is, is kind of what what I'm wondering, and if you have any thoughts at this stage in in this project on that. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, a great question, and I think uh, I feel like the internal struggle of um, of standards, right? How do we how do we have standards when we also need to focus on uniqueness, right? The standards 
always, always push back on the need for that um, need for sort of diversity of of um, of I don't know the world really. <laughs> It's like the whole world, so it's a it's a huge problem. And so, uh, you know, so one of the things is this the um, Nicola uh, Indigenous Terminology Platform Project is actually intended to um, assist with that in in the way that instead of having one set of vocabularies that's meant to like be used across everywhere, it's thinking how can we bring in different so develop vocabulary, but also be a space to hold different kinds of vocabularies, because sometimes if you have a collection, you might need to have a very specific um, and very, uh, like I could see something being very geographically or nation focused. So if you have a, a you know, you might need a very um, detailed and um, I feel like I need a whiteboard. I probably I'm not even gonna try and use the team's whiteboard, so I shouldn't have mentioned it. But but you know, you might need something very detailed versus something that's more sort of large scale. And I think these are are important questions that are emerging to say what would it look like to move across um, platforms to consider something like identity or to consider something like geographies and what do we even call a location, for example, in data, and what would that look like in multiple languages and what does that do for our systems? And so I think our systems need to catch up in a way. So what our repositories are doing and um, what our standards are doing. And I think we're going to, I hope, I always hope we will get there um, if we have the intention to do that. And I think unlike maybe 15 years ago, we have, um, we have the technical capacity and some ways to allow for different standards to sit alongside each other. We see that with things like um, the Homosaurus, if you're familiar with that uh, set of vocabularies, that's for the LGBTQ um, plus community, that, that those terminologies are being able to be implemented in systems alongside other vocabularies. So I don't know if that answers your question exactly, Alexander, but we, you know, it is always a problem when we need to have standards. Um, but if the principles are there, I think that's the important part. If we have an understanding that we need to do, make sure that we're not, that we're meeting the principles of UNDRIP or the principles of care or the principles of understanding who should be able to say, um, then I feel like we are on a good path. Thank you very much. This um, question from Rebecca, um, I'm not sure yet if this is your question, but your presentation made me think of how to possibly include conditions to access data or collections and repositories such as geographic or permission of respected community members. Yes. Um, yeah, so that is an important consideration and there are repositories like um, uh, Mercadio that, that have protocols in place to be able to set um, access based on geographies or or community. So I didn't include this in the talk today, but I can try and remember to add it to my list of resources right after this talk so that you can go and look at that. And that, you know, again, that repository um, software is intentionally created for Indigenous materials. So that is built right in. It's not something that has to be, sometimes I feel like when we have our systems, we're trying to like make them appropriate but they'll never quite be 100% appropriate because they're they're built for a different kind of understanding of the world or way of, of working, which is sometimes based more in the individual. So, you know, a lot of repositories, you can set access based on your user type rather than potentially on your, your community or setting the access at the point of material, which tends to be um, either an open or closed, right? It's open or it's closed. Uh, we have our dark archives <laughs> and our open archives. So rethinking that level of access is really important. And um, certainly there's um, things like the local context labels, which are doing some of that work uh, as well that sit alongside or, or sort of 
work through a kind of approach uh, that is similar to the Creative Commons. Uh, you're welcome. So again, I know that so if anybody has anything also they would like to add because I know um, that some of you here may have a lot of experience as well. So um, I did want there to be if you want to add something, you're very welcome. Um, not just not just to ask questions. All right, does anybody feel like they have a research data management plan in place that they would like to share? You're welcome also to maybe put that in the chat. I always like to learn more as well, so. Hi. <laughs> Um, Lachlan's directed me in the chat to share ours, which I can do in a minute. Um, so by ours, I mean uh, dolls. And yes, he's rightly pointed out that he could do it himself. So um, Lachlan, get on that. Um, <laughs> I don't have a question. I did want to say, Stacey, though, thank you so much for speaking today. I wrote down heaps of notes. Um, I love your love note to the future. I think that's such an apt description of what good metadata can be. Um, and I think there often is a tension between recognizing Indigenous rights and, you know, um, sharing openly. But I think that when we are respectful and when we're really clear and document and think about intention, then I think um, that they can sit kind of side by side. Um, what else did I write down? I, I I stressed this when I wrote it and then underlined it um, because I, I shared that same idea of like this needs to become part of the work process. So sort of integrated into process rather than an afterthought. So really glad that you said that. Um, I will be joining Nicola. I haven't done that yet, um, but thank you for that plug. Um, and the other thing that you said that I loved was just that open doesn't equate with equity. Um, and I think that that's a really important nuance. Um, they're not the same thing at all. So thanks again. That was brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. And also to Lise for pointing out that the love note to the future. Yes, I did not. I wish I came up with that, but I didn't. You can, I believe, buy t-shirts, which I should do. Yeah, I was like, Looking today, I'm like, oh, I really should buy one of those T-shirts that has metadata as a love note to the future. Um, and so, uh, uh, yes, I did not, I cannot take credit uh, for that as at all. Um, I'm just looking at. Um, uh, oh, look, Anne and Christian. So, so. Um, Mackenzie around um, subject headings. I think it really depends on what your approach is going to be. So that's probably not something I can answer in the next um, couple of minutes. But um, and I I know again I know see see some people on this call like Christine Bone uh, and Camille um, um, Collison who have done uh, work on this as well on thinking about different ways to change your subject headings. Uh, Christian Spister, who's also commented, has done some work as well. Um, so there's different approaches. Um, and I'm going to look to the talk about Maui Hudson. I think I included it on the list of resources. Um, if I didn't, let me double check. There should be a, a, a link to his paper um, there and I'll just check. And data life cycle. Um, yeah, I think it's just this idea that a life cycle requires an end. I think sometimes when I feel like life cycle means, does it end and sort of 
degrade and then come alive. Like there's just something about life cycle that implies a potentially um, something that doesn't necessarily happen with data, right? So maybe it's just my thinking around, is there a different way we could talk about, about data because it, it doesn't necessarily um, have that same approach, but, you know, probably again, something I can't answer in the next uh, couple of minutes. Yeah, so I, I'm, I guess, yes, so archive data, um, yes, I think it's I think it's this also this question of archive data versus data for reuse and how we're thinking of some of those pieces. And there's probably like a whole other um, session that could be done on just interrogating or looking at the concept of the life cycle. I know that there are some some ways that that model has been um, visited or commented on in an ind indigenous context. Um, and so. Um, that is something we could like for a future conversation, maybe that we could uh, sort of pull apart what what some of those things mean. And also when sometimes when we talk about things like ecosystem or landscape and to just again interrogate a little bit what we mean by by some of those uh, models. One minute left if anyone has a last minute <laughs> question. Oh, thank you, Lachlan. Thank you. You can tell it's like actually sunny here today and I feel like I'm sitting in my not normal seat for, for these things and it's getting quite, quite, uh, quite sunny. Oh, you don't see the link of resources? Okay, did everybody see it? No, let me um, grab it again and see if I can put it in in there. Oh, maybe I didn't actually press send. Now can you see it? Yes. <laughs> it's been sitting this whole time <laughs> in my like chat. <laughs> Sorry, I thought everyone had it. <laughs> I would have left and never known. <laughs> Okay, I guess that's time. Thank you so much, Stacy, and thank you to everybody who came out. Have a yes, good thank, day. thank you, everybody. <laughs>